Can you see? Can you see? Can you see? Okay. Oh, sorry. All got quiet. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So. <laughs> it's always nice to see a good crowd, and we always get a good crowd when he's around. So that's good. So next week we have Kate Story, who has interviewed over a hundred Kennedy members neighbors, friends, security, and household employees to produce a new meticulously researched book um, called um, The White House at, at, at Hyannisport. Um, reviews have been excellent, and apparently there's new information, as in gossip. <laughs> so, so you need to come for that. That should be good. No cake or ice cream, but desserts. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsor of tonight's program, Leslie Wallace, who many of you know and as our greeter. And please let her know how much she's missed when she's not here. So I give her a hard time all the time, so you give her a hard time too. Um, tonight's speaker really needs no introduction to anyone who comes regularly to Tales of Cape Cod because he's been here many, many times. In fact, he's given this lecture before, but this one, this time he's um, included more information, and so it'll be a different lecture, lecture different but, ending. Um, the same topic that we all love, Lizzie. So uh, Greg Williams is a retired judge having served 15 years on the district court bench, the last 10 years of his tenure as first justice of Edgartown District Court, and as presiding justice of the Southern District of the Appellate Division, which decides appeals in civil cases. Not long before his gubernatorial appointment to the bench in 1999, he had been named Deputy Chief of the Western Division of the Attorney General's Office in Springfield, where he had started as a senior litigator in 1996. Before that, he was a lawyer in private practice with the firm of Brooks, McCauley, McCauley Sanborn, and strangely enough, Williams. So um, I'd like to... <laughs> I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Greg Williams. As if you've ever seen me before, you know that my, one of my many weaknesses is the technological aspect of this. I couldn't even get over here from the damn chair without dropping the microphone. So pardon me for a moment while I adjust myself. Well, not myself, but my <laughs> Where are the tech people in here? Well, anyway, uh, Ann said that this was the same uh, lecture that I've given before. And first of all, I don't like the, ter the term lecture. Uh, I prefer to call it more of a the term maybe uh, gala or festival or <laughs> something like that, but uh, is this, can everybody hear this? But it is going to be a little bit different tonight because I'm not going to have anything about murders in it, nothing about Fall River, uh, just to shake it up a little bit. And uh, let's start off though by uh, seeing if I can work this, which is, who knows. Chapter one, the murders. This woman is uh, Adelaide, I actually spelled her name wrong on here. Various sources spell her middle name differently. It's really Buffington and not Buffington. Uh, Adelaide Buffington Churchill, 
uh, lived next door to the Borden family. She was a 43-year-old widow, and she lived on that house in uh, 2nd Street in Fall River with her mother, her sister, her son, her niece, and a hired man. And about 9 o'clock in the morning on Thursday, August 4th, 1892, she saw her next-door neighbor, Andrew Borden, uh, standing by his kitchen steps. Don't worry, we have a picture of the kitchen steps. Just hold on. <laughs> And uh, about 11 o'clock, she went down to Hudner's uh, Market to buy groceries for that evening's dinner. And when she, and that was only about a block away, South Main Street in Fall River. It's, when, you, when you live in Fall River, apparently, it's, you don't go downtown, you go down street. And uh, that's where she went to do her marketing. And when she came back, she saw the uh, uh, maid for the Bordens, a woman named Bridget Sullivan, known as Maggie crossing the street back to the house from across the street at Dr. Seabury Bowen's house. And according to uh, Adelaide, she looked very white and she was moving fast. So Churchill didn't think too much more about that. She got into her house, got into her kitchen, put down her groceries, and then looked out her kitchen window toward the Borden house, which at that time was 92 Second Street. And that's the house. So that's the Borden house here. Here goes the pointer. I love this. There's the Borden house. There is the side door. There's the steps. That's the Borden's barn. And that's the Churchill house. See where the arrow is? It says Churchill house. And, that's an arrow. <laughs> and uh, I love this. It's got this carpenter gothic sort of trim on there. We didn't go for that over here at the Borden house. But, <laughs> But Churchill has it. It's pretty cool. So, but you can see how close these houses uh, were on 2nd Street there in Fall River. Uh, this house is still there, you probably know. Uh, has anybody ever visited the Borden house? Has anybody ever uh, spent the night in the Borden house? <laughs> has anybody ever taken their spouse to the Borden house for a wedding gift? <laughs> okay. um, all right. Anyway, uh, so you can see how close this is. There's a wooden fence in here between. That's the Borden barn. There's still a, an outbuilding there at the Borden house, but it's not this building. This building was destroyed in the 1920s. So anyway, Churchill's in there. She looks out her kitchen window, and she sees 32-year-old Lizzie Borden right there at the screen door. And according to Churchill, she looked excited or agitated as though something had happened. So Churchill raised her window. You know, God forbid you have the window open. It's only probably about 92 degrees. And uh, calls over there and says to Lizzie, uh, if, asks her if anything was the matter. And Lizzie replies to her, oh, Mrs. Churchill, do come over. Someone has killed father. So. That began the whole saga. The Borden household, which is 58.5 miles from this building. I just made that up. No, it's true. It's really true. Um, there's the side door again. I told you we'd had plenty of the side door. Andrew Jackson Borden was 69 years old. You'll see a lot of sources that say that he's 70. He wasn't 70 quite yet, almost. Um, his wife. Abby Durfee Gray Borden was 64. This was Lizzie's older sister, Emma Borden. Uh, this photograph was only discovered, uh, as you see there, because I wrote it on there, uh, about 2008. And uh, this is kind of exciting because here she is wearing a pansy pin. And uh, I don't know whether she got that from Lizzie or Lizzie took hers, but you'll see a later photograph of Lizzie, and she's wearing a pansy pen, too. She was known as the girl with the pansy pen. Anyway, that's the older sister. There was another sister who died in infancy. Uh, uh, back, she was between these two. So that's who's in the house. You've got Andrew, you've got Abby, you've got uh, Emma, and you've got Lizzie. Again, she's 32 years old at this time. And the maid is 25-year-old Bridget Sullivan. Uh, whoops, sorry. There it is. There's the pansy pin. I probably have these in the wrong order, as usual. 
Uh, this, this was a colorized photograph. Those should be blue right there. Uh, there's the pansy pin. And who knows what's coming up next? Let's see. There's, uh, there's Maggie, Bridget Sullivan. There she is uh, back in the day. Here she is a little bit later. She got a lot more jolly and fun-loving as she aged. Uh, <laughs> Uh, th this woman is interesting, though. She was from Ireland. She worked there at the Bordens, and she ended up uh, moving to Montana and marrying a guy named Sullivan. No relation. So uh, that picture there, that the older... Whoops, that's a dead guy. The, uh, <laughs> the, older, the older photo here, that's, that was uh, surely taken in Montana because she stayed there. Anna, Anaconda, Montana, for the rest of her life. So when, uh, on this day when Churchill called over, Emma, who you just saw the picture of there, she had been visiting friends in Fairhaven for the previous two weeks. Uh, so she was about 15 miles away on this date. Uh, Lizzie had, when Churchill saw her, Lizzie had just yelled up the back stairs to Bridget to come down from her third floor room where she was napping. Andrew was dead in the sitting room, still bleeding from numerous wounds to his face and head. And Abby was face down on the rug in the second floor guest room. And she'd been dead between an hour and a half and two hours at that time. Now, across the street from the Borden home, I already mentioned Dr. Seabury Bowen. He, he was not home when, when Bridget had gone over there to summon him, but he soon did arrive at the house. By the way, he was not the only doctor in the neighborhood. If you remember the photo of the Borden house, to the right of that house was another house. That guy was a doctor, a guy named Dr. Kelly. There was also yet another doctor who lived in the house behind them, a Dr. Shagnon. Uh, they don't play any part in this at all. They were never summoned or anything else. And there's some speculation to the effect that they were not called because Dr. Kelly, Irish, Catholic. Dr. Shagnon, French, Canadian, Catholic. Can't have that. <laughs> so we're going to wait for Dr. Bowen. Uh, Bowen gets over. He, for, he does get home. He's, he's over there pretty soon. And he is pointed toward the sitting room where Andrew uh, Borden is lying on a love seat with his head propped up on the arm of the love seat on some folded garment probably the coat that he, had, that he had walked around town in earlier that morning. And it didn't take uh, Dr. Bowen long to determine that uh, Andrew had been murdered. Uh, he was, he, th this guy was quite a uh, forensic. Uh, <laughs> uh, so he did figure that out. And uh, the thing about this photo is, you know, you talk about crime scene photos. This is in the early days of crime scene photos. Probably the first in situ, I'm making all this up at this point, I don't even, uh, the first in, in situ crime scene photograph was probably about four years before this. It was a, two photographs, maybe three, that were taken in London in November of 1888 of the last victim of Jack the Ripper, a woman named Mary Jane Kelly, which is a horrific and I mean seriously horrific photographs. Those are really awful photographs. These photographs, the police did not have a police photographer. They got a guy who was just a professional photographer in Fall River and asked him if he would do this, to take photographs of not only the scenes where the victims were, but also the house and the yard and all that kind of stuff. So he came over and took these photographs. That guy up there is, uh, who knows who he is, because a lot of people were walking around the house, but he was probably a police officer. Uh, there is some speculation that Andrew uh, was not really in this position uh, when the police entered the room, that he had been repositioned in an attempt to perhaps preserve his dignity a little bit. Uh, according to Lizzie's testimony, she helped him. These, these boots are called uh, Congress boots or Congress shoes. They're the ones with the elastic sides. You guys, a lot of you guys probably had beetle boots. Uh, that's pretty much what these are. She said, though, that she had removed his shoes when he came into the house and put slippers on. So 
There's some speculation that the police moved him around a little bit to make him look a little bit more respectable and to put his shoes on and sort of get his shoes down on the floor the way you see there. Who knows for sure? But uh, that's him anyway, and uh, he's, uh, he's not in good condition right here. This, 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 just so you know, and you get your bearings a little bit, if you have not been in the house, this door here goes into the dining room. This door here goes into the front parlor. So this sitting room is sort of back off the street a little bit. And the belief is obvious that this door was open and the killer, whoever that was, was leaning in to the sitting room from the dining room. So anyway, there we go. Uh, Mr. Borden's face was obliterated. It was later described as resembling raw meat. Uh, there were 10 generally parallel wounds. The longest one was about four and a half inches long uh, toward the left side of his head and face, uh, down to his jaw. One of his eyes was bisected. There was some, not evident in the photograph, there was some blood spatter on the wall here, uh, some on the floor here a little bit. Uh, but nothing, and Dr. Bowen said this later, nothing to indicate the slaughter that had taken place. So uh, there you go. And you can't even really see it in this photograph. And they didn't take close-up photographs of that kind of evidence. A lot of people assume that in murders like this, where somebody gets hit 10, 12, 15 times with an axe or a hatchet, that there's going to be blood all over the place. Probably not. Only if you get, only if you, if you, if you bisect an artery or something, you're going to get an arterial spurt. That's going to fly all over the place. But uh, with these kind of wounds, not necessarily, as you see. Uh, and I did mention this one time in here before. I always thought, I thought that arterial spurt would be a good rock group name. Uh, but I went online and it was too late. There was already a group called Arterial Spurt. So, anyway. Uh, Bowen did indicate at trial that probably some blood was flung about by the rising and falling of the weapon. You know, you hit, it, hit him in the head once and then you pull the hatchet up and probably some uh, matter would come off of the hatchet at that time. And the interesting thing about this, as you know if you've read anything, is that people are in this house pretty quickly after Mrs. Churchill sees Lizzie at that screen door. She comes rushing over there, and within a few minutes, there are plenty of other people in the house, and they're observing Lizzie. She doesn't have a hair out of place. She doesn't have blood on her dress, her face, her hands, nothing. So, uh, Liz, you know, people are assembling, and Lizzie says that... Uh, uh, well, Abby is not here because Abby received a note to the effect that somebody in town was ill, so she left the house to go attend to that person. Uh, then she added, though, that she didn't know, but that maybe Abby had been killed, too, because she thought she heard Abby come back into the house. So the story is getting a little fluid at this point about Abby. And finally, in search of Abby, uh, Maggie Sullivan, Bridget Sullivan and Mrs. Churchill venture up the front stairs. Uh, again, if you haven't been in the house, it's weird. There really aren't any hallways. The rooms empty into each other when you go through the house. And the house is essentially cut in, separated in half. Uh, <laughs> so if, for instance, uh, and Lizzie, Lizzie and Emma's bedrooms are on the second floor, if they want to go up to their bedroom, they go up the front stairs. Um, and that's the only way you can get up there, to their part of the house. When Andrew and Abby wanted to go up to their room, they go up the back stairs, which is right off of where that door was that you saw, that side door. So once you're up on the second floor, you can, for instance, you can't really get from Lizzie and Emma's rooms to Abby and Andrew's room. It, the whole thing is kind of... There, there are doors there, but they're all blocked up by furniture at that time. It's weird. Uh, anyway, so the two go upstairs. It's Maggie and, and Adelaide. And they head up the front stairs. And as you walk up those front stairs, the, first, the room on the left is the guest room where the previous night, Lizzie and Emma's 
Uncle John Vinicum Morse had stayed. He just showed up the previous afternoon, and he stayed there that night. So that's a guest room. So you walk up, you get to the top of the stairs, the guest room is here, and then there's Lizzie's room is ahead there. And to get to Emma's room, she has to walk through Lizzie's room. So there's one point on the stairs that uh, if you look left, you can see under the bed that's in the guest room, looks like this. Um, and just for uh, illustrative purposes, there's a woman lying here. The furniture in the house is not original to this time. It, it's period furniture, but it's not, it's, this is not the furniture that was in there at the time of this event. But to illustrate how you can do it, and it's really like one step where you can see under there and you can see that somebody's there. Well, the first person up the stairs was uh, Sullivan. She apparently didn't look left. But then Churchill did, and she saw something uh, from underneath the, from the stairs underneath the bed, and she decided that what she saw was Abby lying there. So, uh, needless to say, they both went downstairs. They reported that finding, and uh, Bowen, who had left for a little while to run an errand, I think he left the house to go send a telegram from Lizzie to this guy's the doctor. He's doing this errand boy work where he's sending a telegram to Emma over in Fairhaven to say, come on back home. So anyway, now Bowen goes up there, and he goes up to Abby. And Abby is lying face down on the rug between the bed. Uh, and on her right against the wall is a dresser. And there is a congealed pool of blood darkening the rug around her head. And those are the two photographs of Abby. Um, and you can see that she's already been sort of, she was flipped over a couple of times before these photographs were taken. So the forensics weren't that great then. And it's not the fault of the Fall River Police, it's just the way it was. You know, uh, and, and she's got a sheet on her hair. They put a sheet on her. Um, she has huge shoes here. And I think I read once that those are Andrew's shoes. So when she would run around the house doing some of this dusting in the morning, she would just slip his shoes on and do that. So that's why her feet are so big. The woman's five feet tall, so no. Feet not that big. Um, so Abby, 19 wounds. One on her back, about four inches below her neck. Got another 18 on her head most of them toward the right side. She has facial contusions caused by her, uh, as I just said, five feet, 200 pound frame hitting the floor. So she's got some facial contusions there, and probably also some lividity by the time Dr. Bowen gets up there. And most, kind of tragically almost, in her forehead is a flap wound. And what that means is whoever killed her, she saw them. She was hit there kind of glancingly on the forehead and then probably trying to get away, turned around, and that was the end of it. But whoever it was, she saw. Bowen uh, takes a look at the congealing and congealed blood in the rug, uh, notices that Abby's body is cooled considerably and estimates that she had obviously been killed first before Andrew puts it at about 9.30 or so in the morning. And again, uh, Andrew's just after 11 o'clock in the morning. Chapter two, the evidence. Uh, this is the part where I hope I can give you a little judicial perspective. This is the judicial perspective. <laughs> because if you're in the Fall River, uh, what is it, Brian, if a house of justice Fall River Judicial Center or something. It's not just courthouse, God forbid. It's some name like Fall River Temple of Law and Justice or something. Anyway, yeah, you call it a courthouse. Yeah, I know. But uh, this was a picture that uh, is taken from the, from the uh, lobby of the, of the district court <laughs> bench up in, uh, at the Fall River uh, courthouse, I guess. Uh, the judge's parking is right down there. And... Uh, there's the solar panels. Right? All right. Anyway, that's where the church, that's where the Churchill house is, and you can see it's gone. That was at one time the Kelly house over there. But that's the house. 
uh, painted in authentic colors. That is a color called drab. <laughs> and that color was chosen by Lizzie. So, uh, but, but that's, that's your judicial viewpoint, judicial perspective. Now, there was no question but that Lizzie was in the house. She might have gone out to the barn. She might have been in the backyard where the pear trees were. And when Andrew was murdered, there's almost no question that she was there about two hours or so earlier when Abby was murdered. And that is the core of the Commonwealth's case against Lizzie, is that she was there. Uh, a theory that they eloquently called exclusive opportunity, which is not a really all that fully formed judicial doctrine, at least as far as I know. Uh, but their whole deal was, well, she had to have done it. She was there. Uh, there was no one else around. Well, that's not even really true because Sullivan was there. She was on the third floor, maybe. She had been running around earlier in the morning washing all the windows, even though she was sick and she was ordered by Abby to do that, but she was there in the house too. Additionally, I would point out that Massachusetts law is such that the mere presence at the scene of a crime is not enough to prove a defendant guilty. Presence alone does not establish a defendant's knowing participation in a crime. To find a defendant guilty, there must be proof that the defendant intentionally participated in some way in committing that particular crime and had, a, had the intent or shared the intent required to commit the crime. But is somebody's presence at the scene of a crime like this enough to charge them with the murders? As I say, the police didn't have a whole lot else. They had really not much against her. Uh, so, what was it that caused the Commonwealth to charge, some of you may not be from Massachusetts uh, originally, and, or, or even now, I don't know, but when I say the Commonwealth, I mean the government. Elsewhere would be the state or the people, but here it's the Commonwealth. That's the government, that's the prosecuting uh, agency. So, where was I? Oh, what else do they have? They had two factors. Uh, one of them tended to sharpen police focus on her, and the second factor convinced the grand jury to indict her for the murders of her mother, another mother, her father, and her stepmother. After this happened, of course, the police are there pretty quickly, uh, and they come in there, it's not necessarily a CSI situation such as you might see on television. Uh, people are not wearing hazmat suits and setting up tents and dusting for prints and all that kind of thing. There's none of that going on. Uh, but they are looking around, obviously, to uh, see what they can find. And they question Lizzie uh, at various times during the day. For much of this time, she was with friends and Dr. Bowen up in her room. Uh, you know, she's getting fanned and cold uh, eau de toilette is being applied to her wrists and all that sort of stuff. And uh, Dr. Bowen is starting to administer some medications to her. One of them is kind of, essentially it's aspirin. Uh, oh, there's her room, I wanted to show that. That's, uh, that's her room. Uh, probably, again, the furnishings are not original to 1892, but she probably had the best furnished room in the house because she had a lot of little mementos. She had gone on a very long uh, trip to Europe in 1890, uh, which her father paid for, with a group of other Fall River women, and they went everywhere, and she collected a lot of stuff. She was very interested in art. Uh, she loved Scotland, anything to do with Scotland. She had to have that. So she had a lot of that kind of thing in her room. But she's in there, uh, again, people are fluttering around her, trying to keep her uh, comfortable and all that kind of thing, and the police would come in there, sort of, one, one would come in, ask a few questions, he'd leave, another one would come in, ask a few more questions, and he'd leave, that sort of stuff. And at one point, one of the questions involved the phrase, your mother. Not like, you, you know, your mother. And uh, she says, she is not my mother. My mother died when I was young. Now, we don't know how she said that. We don't know what her tone was. We don't know what her inflection was. She, 
she could it could have been a very gentle clarification of her relationship. Just, just you know, just so you know, this woman is not my mother. Uh, my mother died long ago when I was very young. Or she might have snapped it out. You know, who knows? But however she said it, the police inferred that Lizzie was harboring ill feelings toward Abby, which wasn't entirely unfair. Uh, but to them, L Lizzie's g demeanor generally, she wasn't hysterical or anything like that by any stretch of the imagination, and the apparent lack of all-consuming love that she felt or didn't feel for Abby, that added up to them to be motive. These people are in this house. She doesn't like this woman who's still lying probably about 20 feet away. And she's the only one around here, except for the maid. She has that presence plus motive. And that's what the focus really starts coming in on her. Now, motive's not an element of the crime of murder. You know, you always talk about, well, they didn't prove mo motive. They didn't prove motive. You know, the Commonwealth doesn't have to prove motive. They want to. It's good because it tells the story and the juries want to hear it. They want to hear why something happened. Why could this person have done this, especially in a situation like this? But it's not an element of the crime. Uh, so the police, people ask why, who could have done this, why. Lizzie was there. She didn't like her stepmother. There's our story. The Bordens uh, were buried... This all is a Thursday now, August 4th, 1892. The Bordens were buried sort of, kind of, uh, well, it was a funeral, let's put it that way. They weren't really, we won't go into the whole thing where they cut their heads off at the cemetery. That's a whole other story. But uh, the funeral's on Saturday, and that night, who shows up at the Borden home, Lizzie's home, but the mayor of Fall River, a guy named Dr. John Coughlin, and the city marshal, who is, in essence, the chief of police, a guy named, a guy named Rufus Hilliard, they show up. And uh, they're talking to Lizzie, and Emma's there and everything. And uh, their ostensible purpose for being there was to say, you know, whatever you need uh, in terms of police presence around here to keep the crowds at bay, because there were a lot of people would fill up 2nd Street just to stare at this house. Uh, and in fact, Uncle Morse had gone to the post office, and they figured that a 1,000 people followed him. Uh, I think that was the day before, maybe on Friday. So the police, and, it, and rightfully so, they go in there and they say, you know, if you need anything, we're going to have police guards around here, but uh, if you need anything more than that, um, let us know. Uh, but then all of a sudden, Lizzie, who, with her little pansy pen and everything, she's not a shrinking violet. And she's not even a shrinking pansy. So... They say, you know, we've got our, you know, we're working on this, blah, 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 we're interviewing people and all that kind of thing. And we've got some people we're really we're starting to look at. And Lizzie essentially asked, not quite this bluntly, but almost, am I one of them? Are you looking at me? Is there suspicion falling on me? And I want to know that right now. Well, you know, so they dance a little bit. And finally they say, yes. Yes, we are looking at you. Yes, you're a suspect. Now that's Saturday night. So that focus is there on Lizzie, as far as the police are concerned. That's Saturday the 6th. Um, there is an inquest into the deaths of Andrew and Abby that starts on the 9th. So that's what, 6, 7, 8, nine, Tuesday. It's before a district court judge, a guy named Josiah Blaisdell. And that goes for a couple of days. The leading case on inquests in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you probably have heard of this, it's called Commonwealth versus Kennedy, and it concerns an incident on Chappaquiddick in the vineyard that occurred 54 years ago tomorrow. So uh, an inquest is not an adversarial proceeding. It is one in which a judge investigates a death to make a determination as to whether or not that death resulted from a crime. Well, that's not much of a challenge here. Uh, you know, they were both clearly murdered. We, we know that. But no question, inquest is in order, and they properly do it. That's not, not an issue at all. Um, 
But it also served as a pretty perfect occasion to try to get under Lizzie's skin a little bit. Let's pressure Lizzie a little bit. Uh, maybe we can even build a motive against Lizzie a little bit. The DA was a guy named Hosea Knowlton, who ended up being the Attorney General of the Commonwealth. Um, and he is quite, Lizzie testified under oath at this inquest. In fact, she was there a couple of days. But he asked about her knowledge of her father's will, uh, about his wealth, uh, quite wealthy, by the way. I didn't mention that earlier. Uh, even despite that house that you saw, uh, he's multimillionaire by today's, in today's money. Multi-millionaire. So she, he asked about that. He asked about uh, what do you know about his real estate holdings, which were pretty considerable in Fall River, owned a couple of farms in Swansea and Somerset, that kind of stuff. And then he starts using this kind of cheesy trick uh, of trying to shock her uh, into breaking down or confessing. At least that's my view of it. And here's the question and the answers that I'm looking at. What did you tell Maggie? And she says, I told her he was hurt. When you first told her, I says, go for Dr. Bowen as soon as you can. I think father is hurt. Did you then know that he was dead? No, sir. You saw him? Yes, sir. You went into the room. He's talking about the sitting room. No, sir. Looked in at the door. I opened the door and rushed back. Saw his face? No, I did not see his face because he was all covered with blood. You saw where the face was bleeding? Yes, sir. Did you see the blood on the floor? No, sir. You saw his face covered with blood? Yes, sir. Did you see his eyeball hanging out? No, sir. See the gashes where his face was laid open? No, sir. Nothing of that kind? No, sir. Now, would you ask a woman, or anybody, who lost their father five days previously about his mutilated face and his eyeball hanging out, uh, if you hadn't focused on her as the killer, or at least had a pretty strong suspicion that she was the killer? It's pretty callous. Uh, this is this part of it anyway, to my thinking, uh, maybe not all the judicial figures in the audience, but um, to my figure, uh, to my thinking, uh, this is more like a police interrogation, not an inquest. Now, the family lawyer was a guy named Andrew Jackson Jennings. Lizzie's father is Andrew Jackson Borden. Uh, and this is him. And uh, actually, I got a better picture of him. <laughs> picture. Captain. And you see on the shirts there where it says Troy. That's what Fall River was called at one point. Before it was named Fall River, it was called Troy. So there he is. That's a great picture. Come on. No matter in what setting, this picture should be used. Even if it's not about Lizzie Borden or baseball or anything, it's just a great picture. So anyway, there he is, Andrew Jennings, and he says, you know this inquest where you're going to question, uh, he's the family lawyer, you're going to question Lizzie, I'd, I'd like to be in there with Lizzie. And the judge says, no, you can't come in here. Which was his right. The inquest is not necessarily open to everybody in the world, but that was a big mistake for the Commonwealth. Denied. So Andrew Jennings doesn't go into the... Uh, into the inquest testimony of Lizzie, he goes back and plays baseball. <laughs> so, and then we go to the inquest, she's testifying under oath, she doesn't do very well, Lizzie. And part of that might be, if you're a Lizzie fan, this is gonna be your excuse, is that, I mentioned the medications that she was taking earlier, it starts off with this bromide, this sort of aspirin almost, which is pretty benign, but then it turns into morphine. So she's taken some morphine, not, you know, not Samuel Taylor Coleridge levels or anything, but she's taken, uh, she's taken morphine since, since Thursday night. Maybe it clouded her responses, maybe it clouded her mind, maybe it colored what she said, maybe it didn't, who knows. But she was fairly inconsistent during this, this questioning and that wasn't good. 
Particularly, she was inconsistent about her whereabouts when her father arrived home. Uh, she was in the kitchen reading an old Harper's magazine. Uh, oh, no, wait a second. She was ironing in the dining room. Uh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Nope. Top of the front staircase. Well, that's where the Commonwealth wants her. They want her upstairs. They want her at the top of the staircase because if she's standing at the top of the staircase, she's about 15 feet from Abby's cooling body. So that's where they want her. And there's also a little story that, and this came from Maggie slash Bridget, that Andrew gets home and uh, comes home early. They don't really expect him home late in the morning. He's running around downtown. He's been retired since he was 50. Two, I think, but he still is the president of a million banks, and he's on the board of this, that, and the other, and he owns all this real estate you know, right off of, on South Main Street. So he comes home early because he doesn't feel well. There's been a lot of illness in the family that week, and he's having trouble getting in the front door, and so Maggie rushes over to the front door, and she's having trouble uh, getting the door open for him. He's out front. Of course, he's, he's, the, he's the patriarch of this whole tiny little house. And he's trying to get in, and uh, Lizzie, I mean, not Lizzie, uh, Maggie's getting frustrated because she can't get the door unlocked. And I'm sorry to have to say this word, but I want to keep it authentic. Uh, she's getting really frustrated, and so she blurts out, Oh, Shaw. <laughs> and uh, she says at that moment, she hears a laugh from the top of the stairs, and it was Lizzie. Did that happen? Who knows? And if it did happen, so what? But it becomes this big sinister thing. Anyways, so where she is in the house when Andrew gets home, that's a little, little uh, unclear and contradictory. And also problematic is uh, her kind of odd story that soon after her father gets home and s starts in on this nap in the sitting room, she goes out to the barn and first she goes out in the yard and starts picking up pears. That's a big thing to do here, is to pick up pears off the lawn and eat them. And she eats three of them at one go. But she goes up to the loft of this barn, and she's looking for uh, lead, either to fix the window or to make sinkers, because her plan is to go fishing in Marion on the Monday, the following Monday. And supposedly, she's in the, this hot, dusty loft of this barn for 20 minutes, uh, eating pears and looking out the window towards Second Street. And, you know, it, people, people are like, well, really? Are you going to go to the hottest place in the city to go do this? Maybe. Anyway. So after she finishes testifying on that second day, uh, or third day, I guess it was, August 11th, the district attorney says, uh, can you wait over here in the matron's room? And I, it, it was at the police station, central police station of Fall River. This was not at the courthouse. And now they send for Andrew Jennings. Oh, yeah, now you can come. Come on over, Andy. Get off the baseball diamond and come on over. And uh, this guy who had been at the house Saturday night, City Marshal Rufus Hilliard, he arrests Lizzie Borden. And they put her on the train. And they take her to the jail in Taunton, and that's it. It's uh, about eight miles north or so of Fall River. And she would largely, except for court appearances, be spending the next 10, whoop, ten months there. Uh, this is the garden part of it, by the way. I don't know how long that lasted, but anyway. And maybe she was treated a little bit on the special side there. Supposedly she had better meals than everybody else. They, you know, the meals would come in from a restaurant and that kind of stuff. But still in jail, 10 months is 10 months. So that's where she is. Now, a couple of weeks later, they have uh, what they call a preliminary hearing. Uh, today it might be called a probable cause here. And it's before Judge Blaisdell again. It starts on the uh, 25th of August, goes till September 1st. And at the end, uh, Blaisdell uh, says to Lizzie, who he is calling Lizzie, by the way, 
uh, says, you know, if, this, if you were a man, I'd have to find this, that, and the other. And if you were a man, I'd have to do this. If you were a man, I'd have to do that. But given the circumstances, I'm going to have to find that you were, and this is the quote, probably guilty. <laughs> so not that I'm finding probable cause, that there's enough evidence here for this case to go forward, but I'm finding you probably guilty. Then he orders the case to proceed to the grand jury. So the grand jury, here we are at the beginning of September, the grand jury doesn't even convene until November 7th. So she's back out at this place until then, well, and past then, because she doesn't appear in front of the grand jury. And they don't even reach her case until November 15th, and then when they start talking about the Lizzie Borden matter. Now, in the grand jury, you probably know this, maybe some of you have served in a grand jury, the Commonwealth is going to present evidence of someone having committed a crime, uh, and a grand jury is going to decide, in essence, whether there's probable cause for the case to move forward. Uh, fairly low standard. This grand jury uh, apparently had a lot of trouble concluding that there was sufficient evidence against her for this case to go forward until you will remember, well, you won't remember because I haven't mentioned her yet, but she has been around there. Her name was Alice Russell. Alice Mainly Russell. This is the only known photograph of her taken in 1931 when she was in the, uh, what was then called the Old Folks Home, uh, and what I guess I would refer to now as the Old Folks Home. <laughs> but old Alice is a deep friend of both sisters, mostly Emma, but pretty, pretty friendly with both of them. This grand jury thing is going on and on and on. They're not finding anything against Lizzie. And she finally decides to tell her lawyer something that happened in the Borden house a few days after the murders, because she was staying there. She volunteered, I'll stay with you here in the house. Well, this gets cleared up. And she tells her lawyer, a guy named Swift, a tale, and he says, well, you need to go to the DA with this story, which she does. And then on December 2nd, she appears and testifies before the grand jury, and 10 minutes after she finishes, the grand jury goes in the back room and finds probable cause on a vote for of 20 to 1, probable cause against Lizzie Board. What happened was this. She was staying at the home after the murders, and on the Sunday after the murders, remember again, murders are on Thursday, so this is Sunday morning, the 7th of August. She's in the kitchen. And Emma, the sister, is at the sink washing dishes. And Lizzie comes in with a blue dress. She's holding a blue dress. And she says, I'm going to burn this old thing up. It is covered in paint. Because there's a stove in there with a flame. And Alice leaves briefly. She returns. And Lizzie is tearing up the dress. And Russell says, I wouldn't let anybody see me do that, Lizzie. Police are still out in the yard. Still have a police guard there, obviously. It's a couple of days later. This was either incredibly stupid timing or Lizzie was destroying evidence. Um, police are in the yard. The inference is that Lizzie is burning a blood-stained dress. And where else would you do that but the kitchen stove? And that's puzzling, because the police have had free reign over this house. They obviously searched the house. Uh, and you would think that the two things they are looking for and want to find are, one, a murder weapon would be good, and two, a bloodstained dress. So again, if she's burning a bloodstained dress, nobody saw blood on her right after Andrew was murdered. Uh, shame on the police for failing to find it, if that's what that was. And if it wasn't, and she really is burning a paint-covered dress, Lizzie, stop it. <laughs> Why don't you wait till freaking September to do this? <laughs> Why do you have to do it three days after they're dead? So Alice who looks a little smug, it has to be said. Uh, 
She testifies that the, she did tell the grand jury this. They indicted her. She did testify at trial about the burned dress. And she also testified at trial to the fact that Lizzie came to her house the night before the murders, August 3rd. And uh, I'll tell you about that in a little while. But there it is. Uh, and neither of those things apparently swayed the jury. But given the lower standard of proof at the grand jury, it swayed them. She's indicted. And without Alice, we're not here. We're not even here. We don't even know who this woman is, Lizzie Borden. Who is that? We don't know. Because nothing, she wasn't involved in it. She was just an orphan. Chapter 3, the, the law, key evidential trial rulings. Trial was in New Bedford Superior Court. Remember the murders and the, all this is in Fall River, and now we're going over to New Bedford. That's where the courthouse is. At that time in Massachusetts history, capital cases, that is, cases in which a defendant was facing the death penalty, which she was, are tried before a three-judge panel. So there are three justices. You try one now, it's before a single just, justice. Then it was three. Chief Justice of the Superior Court, Albert Mason, a guy named Caleb Blodgett, Justin Dewey. Justin Dewey was appointed to the bench about seven years before this case by her, who was a guy named George Dexter Robinson. Uh, and that's him. And by this time, by this trial, he was not the governor anymore, but he was Lizzie Borden's chief trial counsel. Pretty smart. Pretty smart, Lizzie. Better than that dress burning thing. <laughs> uh, he was paid reportedly $25,000, uh, which now let's call it $650,000, $750,000, who knows? A lot of money. And he was worth every damn nickel of it. A uh, little personal aside here, a friend of mine, an uh, old friend of mine, now retired, but still of counsel in a Springfield uh, law firm named Robinson Donovan. Uh, this Robinson is the Robinson of that law firm. And my friend Jeff is the custodian, or was, I don't know if he still is, but he was when I was out there, of uh, the Robinson Papers. Uh, all the stuff that this guy wrote and probably touched that concern this Lizzie Borden case, still are around, and they're the Robinson Papers held at this law firm in Springfield. And Jeff was the custodian of them. Presumably, those include notes back and forth between counsel Robinson and Lizzie Borden. These have never been made public, and they won't be. Uh, the firm received an opinion from the Board of Bar Overseers, which is the body that governs, governs attorneys in this commonwealth, to the effect that even though Lizzie's been dead for a while, there is still the existence of the attorney-client privilege. And those papers aren't going anywhere. Uh, and he has turned down numerous requests from literally all over the world. Can I just come in and flip through maybe the top, you know. So a lot of people made requests and he's turned every single one of them down, including mine. <laughs> so what I have characterized as the cheesiness of the Commonwealth that had begun with perhaps what you might think was a little bit over aggressive inquest questioning of Lizzie continued. Uh, both these sides have numerous lawyers, not just one lawyer, there's two or three lawyers. And the assistant district attorney is a guy named Thomas Moody, and in his opening statement, as you see I've written here, he displays to the jury a dress. I got a blue dress here. Make of it what you will. Oh, I didn't mean to display those skulls. So he's got the skulls there in a box. Uh, I don't know how those got there, but uh, none of this stuff is in evidence yet, by the way. It's still the opening statement, so cheesy. Uh, and he also starts talking about hatchets. Well, we got, you know, we found, the police found some hatchets in the basement. 
Uh, we found one that doesn't have a handle on it. It looks a little suspicious to us. He's waving that thing around. Okay, fine. Cheesy. So the skulls are later identified as the victims, but the confusion about the dress is never cleared up, what dress she was wearing. She did change her clothes during the day. She put on what she described as a pink wrapper, but the dress that she was wearing in the morning, who knows? Probably wasn't this. Uh, the hatchet head was never identified as the murder weapon. No hatchet, axe, or anything else was ever identified as the murder weapon. Might have been, maybe this was it, kind of made me look like this. That's not good enough, but they were waving it around anyway. Uh, speaking of hatchets. Leslie, go long. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the skulls. Here they are. Now oh, there's the hatchet. Hatchet head, displayed to the jury during the opening, nattered on about it during that trial. Nobody ever identified it as the murder weapon. And the big thing is, you know, they send the stuff up to Harvard. There's got to be blood in there, right? A couple of people got wounded pretty severely. There's got to be blood up inside this thing. Maybe you could wipe this off. But what about under here? And why is this broken off? And by the way, where is that? Well, she clearly burned that thing in the stove. No question about it until they found it in the same damn box. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, now the skulls. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Uh, the, skulls, the skulls were removed uh, from Andrew and Abby at that funeral thing I told you about. They went up to the Oak, Park, uh, Oak Grove Cemetery in Fall River up on the hill, now the Highlands. And they get a message from the Attorney General and he says, why don't you take their heads off? So they did that right there in the cemetery. So they did it. you know they had a, it's not like not out of the grass or anything. They went into a room, but uh, and then they boiled all up, you know. Well, anyway, so the skulls were examined by a couple of guys at Harvard. One of them was a guy named Edward, and I, his last name is Wood, and his middle name is Stickney. Get it? Stick Wood. <laughs> and uh, the other doctor is named David Williams Cheever. Both at Harvard. And they're looking at these skulls once all the flesh and the skin and everything was taken, all the hair and everything. And in one of the cuts in Abby's skull near the right ear, they find a piece of gilt, G-I-L-T. It's, and what it is, it's, and the word, actually I'll, I'll, I'll give you the wording that was used. Shining deposit can be seen with the naked eye. It is plainly visible with the use of a lens when once its situation is located. Again, skulls are all cleaned up, whatever. Gilt is a metal, a metal ornamentation, kind of like, think of it as like, almost like tin foil. And they put it on the edge of axes and hatchets when they sold them. Uh, so to make them look shiny, I guess, and also to protect the blade uh, to some extent. So the conclusion that was reached by Dr. Cheever anyway, was that we're look, you, the weapon here is new. Still had the guilt on it. That's the inference. Uh, and this finding is communicated to D.A. Knowlton. And uh, that, of course, was important because it ran, ran counter to the Commonwealth's theory that it was one of these old hatchets they found in the basement. The Commonwealth didn't tell the defense about that. Cheesy. Unethical, I think. And I mention that because Dr. Cheever's great-grandson is married to my wife's cousin. Uh, there were, though, two items of evidence that the court excluded from evidence that might have assisted the Commonwealth's case uh, greatly. Maybe. The first one was uh, Lizzie's inquest testimony. I told you all about that. And the second piece of evidence is uh, some testimony that was excluded but it was to the effect that Lizzie Borden had gone down to the pharmacy, the drugstore, the day before the murders and tried to buy uh, some poison. And I'll get into it in a second. But uh, before we look at those, let's note again that Moody mentioned both of those things during his opening. The inquest testimony, the poison. That was a bad move, and it's risky, because if you mention something to the jury during your opening statement, and then you don't produce it, they think you're lying to them. Possibly. Who knows? Maybe they didn't even notice. 
but some of the more astute ones. By the way, there were three guys on the jury named Wilbur. Their last names were Wilbur, all spelled differently. So that was weird. But uh, before, we, uh, before we look at that evidence uh, quickly, I know you're dying to get at that cake. Let's look at a couple of uh, things that I think are kind of basic, but I want people to understand, and that is this. There are two verdicts possible in a criminal trial. There's guilty, there's not guilty. There's not guilty or innocent. This final stage uh, in a criminal trial is uh, the judge's instructions. And uh, with those, the judge provides the jury with the law that the jury has to apply to the facts that they find. And I won't consider all that to now and tell you about that, but I want to emphasize something that a lot of you probably already know. And that is that in a criminal trial, the government, the Commonwealth, has the burden of proof that the defendant committed the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, civil cases, it's preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not. But in a criminal case, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. And let me suggest to you that every time anybody ever talks about Lizzie Borden or any case like this, uh, the essential mystery of the case takes over and the question arises, did she do it? Or was she innocent? The concept of innocence has no place in a criminal trial. Oh, there's the skulls. I forgot to show you those. So, you know. Now, a couple of these things, like this. You know, that's an autopsy thing. That, that wasn't a wound there. Take the top off. Um, but anyway, those are the skulls. So I... Innocence. Well, this is a painting that was painted the year of this trial, 1893. And uh, this painting by William Adolph Bougereau of 1893, the jury is not going to find you innocent. They're not going to find, like they don't find this woman innocent. They don't find this baby innocent. They don't find this lamb innocent. This is innocence. It's got nothing to do with a criminal trial. But I do like the painting, so I wanted to show it to you. <laughs> so, question for the jury, guilty, not guilty. Um, so, if you ask yourself, or me, did Lizzie Borden do this? Uh, two answers. According to the jury verdict, no. The Commonwealth did not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she was guilty. Uh, in the world of law, she's not guilty. Uh, does that mean she didn't do it? No. It only means that the Commonwealth didn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she did. But based on all we know, and all that's been said and written about these murders since 1892, without regard to any legal standard, uh, the answer to did she do it is of course she did. <laughs> so, criminal standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm going to skip over this because we're uh, uh, getting a little later. I think. There's the reasonable doubt instruction that uh, we give now. You can read this as well as I can. The key here is you have in your minds an abiding conviction to a moral certainty that the charge is true. Uh, Highest degree of certainty possible in matter re, re, uh, relating to human affairs. So, it doesn't have to be beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's not it. Reasonable doubt. All right. So, uh, the inquest testimony, I'm going to kind of, you know, the whole thing about uh, her confusion at the uh, inquest testimony, that, that would have been good for the Commonwealth to get into evidence at the trial. We don't have to go into that uh, too much, but. The Commonwealth could have made hay with that. She's lying. She can't keep her story straight. She obviously did this. Um, so there's that. Uh, let's get into the night before the, uh, the murder. She goes to... Uh, um, well, before we get to the night, let's go to the day. And that is she goes down to this place called B.R. Smith's Drugstore. It's a few hundred yards down the street from the Borden's house. And she encounters this gentleman, Eli Bentz. He's a clerk, and he testifies at the inquest and at the preliminary hearing that on the morning of August 3rd, late morning, the day before the murders, a woman he later identified as Lizzie Borden came in, and she wanted to buy 10 cents worth of a substance called prussic acid. Prussic acid she wanted to use to remove moths from a seal skin cape. 
So that's, that was her story. Prussic acid is hydrogen cyanide. Uh, cyanide is famously a lethal poison. It, it was the basis of Zyklon B, which was used in the Nazi concentration camps. Uh, it uh, was also the poison used in the 1982 uh, Chicago Tylenol murders. Uh, seven people died from uh, ingesting cyanide-laced Tylenol tablets. And I bring that up because the chief suspect in that case was a guy named James w uh, William Lewis, who died a week ago this past Sunday, age 76. So she tries to buy this poison, according to Benz, and he doesn't sell it to her because she doesn't have a prescription. You have to have a prescription to buy that stuff. You don't have it. Um, Commonwealth wanted Benz to come in and tell that tale, and there was a lot of arguments about whether or not that should be admissible, and the Commonwealth was saying, of course it's admissible. It shows her intent. It showed that she had a murderous intent. She's trying to buy this deadly poison the damn day before these murders. And uh, Robinson's arguing, well, she's not charged with poisoning anybody, and they were examined for poison. They didn't have any poison in their systems. Their stomachs were removed in the house, shipped up to Harvard, and those were examined, and no poison. And the court finds that it is not admissible, this poison evidence, because it is too remote in time. Too remote in time? It was the damn day before. How was it remote in time? But that was, the, that was it. Pretty, I, thought, I think it's pretty probative evidence about her state of mind and her intent, but there you go. And then that night, she spends about two, she goes over to Alice, remember Alice Russell, that smug looking woman in that old folks home? <laughs> she goes over to her house and spends about two hours telling Alice, I have a bad feeling, I can't shake it. Something's going to happen. I, I just know it. Something, somebody's after my father. They're gonna kill him, he's gonna get poisoned. Well, why did you say that, Lizzie? You already tried to buy the poison, <laughs> and you didn't get it. So she starts talking about all the poison, the milk's being poisoned, and Alice is going, you really think people are running around poisoning the milk on your stoop before you pick it up in the morning? She doesn't, oh, no, no, it's the bread. It's not the milk, it's the bread. They're poisoning, you know, they're going to burn the house down. I saw a guy running around the house the other day. I know they're going to play, this is going to be bad. It's going to be really bad. And Alice is going, that's great, just go home. <laughs> so she finally does, and... Uh, she gets home about 9 o'clock, sails up the front steps. Her uncle is in the sitting room talking to Andrew and Abby. She doesn't even say hi to him. She just goes upstairs and goes to bed. Chapter 4, The Birthday. Uh, there's the cake. Not as nice as the cake you're about to see, but still. <laughs> uh, that's Lizzie. That's a relatively recently discovered photograph of Lizzie as a child. So that's her. So she gets acquitted. She goes back to Fall River. They have to wait for the crowds to disperse. There's a big celebration going on in New Bedford. This is great, fantastic, couldn't be better. She, has to, she stays with the, in the judge's lobby for a while while the crowds outside disperse. Finally, uh, goes back to Fall River. Uh, she does not go back to the murder house. Uh, she goes over to Pine Street. She stays at the house of a friend of hers. Um, and then the next day, that friend and Lizzie go to Newport. And she spends, uh, spends the week there in Newport, Rhode Island. And then in July, uh, which is only a few weeks after all this, she, Lizzie and her sister Emma buy a house on French Street, which is on the hill, in, now called the Highlands mostly, in Fall River, which is where you wanted, you, if you were hoity-toity, that's where you wanted to live. That's where the big houses are. And that's where you wanted to live, and they did. So they bought this house uh, called Maplecroft. And I should have brought, I didn't want to get into all this detail, but that's the house kind of at the time, and uh, that's a picture that I took a few years ago with the TV satellite outside. But she didn't have that. Uh, but she did have a lot of other stuff, including servants and cars and all that stuff. So she did pretty well. She lived in Maplecroft. She loved to travel. She loved to go to Boston. She loved to go to New York. Her favorite place to go is Washington, D.C., which is great because that's obviously the best place to be born. And uh, she loved the theater. She formed an attachment with an actress named Nance O'Neill. Uh, the nature of that attachment is unknown, plenty of spe speculation, but who knows. 
She threw dinner parties for theatrical folk, yes, folk, in this house. And uh, that caused the split between Lizzie and Emma. I don't know how wild these parties were, probably not all that wild, but too wild for Emma. And Emma says, I'm out of here, 1905. She moves out of Maplecroft, and they never speak to each other again. Uh, there's Lizzie in 1905, and there's one of my messed up slides. That should be up. Uh, the interesting thing about this, this is from a city directory that a friend of mine has from 1905. Uh, she is now calling herself Lizbeth. That was not her name. Her, name, her birth name is Lizzie Andrew Borden. She's not Elizabeth, she's not Lizbeth. And the guy who lives next door to her was John T. Swift. That's the guy that, remember that smug woman in the old lady's home, old folks' home? That guy was the lawyer that she reported about the dress burning to. He now lives next door to Liz, Lizzie Borden. I don't know how that went. But, so, who can say? But uh, there's Lizzie in 1905. And on July, she was born on July 19th, 1860, 163 years ago, uh, this coming Wednesday. She was born in the house that was owned by her grandfather, Abraham Borden, which at that point was on 12 Ferry Street, uh, which uh, that house doesn't exist any longer. Uh, a lot of people were living in there, a lot of sort of relatives, big family thing going on. Uh, and some bitterness arose between Lizzie and Emma on one hand and Abby on the other because in the late 1880s, a few years before these murders, uh, Abby's half-sister was living, I think it was a duplex, was living in a, in a duplex, and uh, the woman was having some financial difficulties, so Andrew says, well, I'll just buy the house and give it to her. So he did. Uh, he bought the house and he gave it to his wife's family. And Lizzie's attitude toward that was, and I quote, what he did for her people he ought to do for his own daughters. Uh, so he did. He bought the, or gave them the Ferry Street house where they were, where they were born. Uh, the problem with that was it had tenants in it, and managing those tenants was inconvenient for, uh, for Lizzie and Emma. And so he bought it back from them for $5,000 on July 15, 1892, less than three weeks before the murders. Make of that what you will. Uh, as I said, the Ferry Street house no longer exists. Uh, this is Lizzie's mother. She is holding Emma in this picture. Sarah Anthony Morse Borden. She died in 1862. Lizzie was two. Uh, of uterine congestion and disease of spine. Who knows really what that was. Uh, she was 39 years old. Andrew was 40. Lizzie promised Lizzie that, uh, Emma promised Lizzie that she'd take care of baby Lizzie, and she pretty much did for the rest of her life, at least until 1905. Uh, Lizzie Borden died on June 1st, 1927, in Maplecroft, uh, myocarditis, acute bronchitis of nine days duration. Essentially, she had pneumonia, I think. Uh, she was 66 years old, but she lives on in one way or another. And there she is. And now, some of you are, think are probably a little crestfallen, you're a little disappointed. Where's the mutton soup? Where's the rhyme? Lizzie Borden took an ax. There it is. So that's not the actual mutton soup. Most famous breakfast in murder history was the morning of the murders where they ate mutton and Johnny cakes and all that stuff. Probably heard that a million times, but there's the mutton soup. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or you just want to get right at that cake and ice cream? I'm, I'm sorry. He was he was known as Uncle Morse. Very strange guy. He uh, his his full he was 
their birth mother's brother. His name was John Vinicum Morris. And he had lived in Iowa for a while, and then he was kind of moving back to uh, Dartmouth, staying in Dartmouth. Uh, what he was really up to, who knows? Uh, he was kind of looking after the farm a little bit, Andrew's farm. But he showed up the afternoon before the murders. Um, no toothpaste, no toothbrush, no comic book, no nothing, and spent the night there. Uh, and then the next morning, he went to visit some other relatives over on Way Bossett Street, about a mile away. And he came back and, well, where were you? Well, I was on Way Bossett Street. Well, what else can you tell us about that? Well, I can tell you the number of the trolley. I can tell you the badge number of the guy who was collecting the fares on the trolley. <laughs> I can tell you this. I can tell you that. It was ridiculous. He had, he had like this photographic account of where he was that day. So he was clear. He was well. He was briefly until he came up with all this stuff. And the other weird thing he did was when he showed he showed up at the house that morning. Police are all over the place. Everybody else is all over the place. He doesn't even notice them. Goes in the backyard, starts eating pears, and then he walks in the house and goes, "What's going on?" Just a very strange guy, John Vinicum Morse, Uncle Morse. Anybody else? Questions? Comments? Snatches of song? Yes. This is it. That's it? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Did they, like, I don't know, today's on TV, but I could go to the stores and what they say it's one of those things. They did do that. They did do it. Yeah. Never, found. Never came up with it. It was Lizzie Borden. After Lizzie Borden was unsuc unsuccessful in buying the poison, did she come over to the hardware store and buy a hatchet? Nobody knows. They never found it. <laughs> yeah. they, the big thing about the hatchets in the basement was there were a couple of hatchet heads, but the one that they found that was broken, and they said, well, she broke that all because it had blood on it, and then she threw it in the stove. Well, no, it was in the same box. The cops just didn't find it for whatever reason, is that there was a hatchet head down there that appeared to the police had been wet and then rolled in the coal ashes to make it look like it had been down there a long time. That was their theory anyway. But uh, they never did, nobody ever identified the murder weapon. And then another one came up later. There was a, there was a, a roofer's hatchet found on a roof back by Dr. Shagnon's house. Was that the murder weapon? Uh, nobody knows. Nobody knows. But that one, that, that's the one they'll show you at the Fall River Historical Society. Is that one that's broken off. Anybody else? Yes? <laughs> of what, though? Of what? I said, of what, though? Of what? What would you sample? Uh, it's a good, it's, I, I, that hasn't happened. Uh, be easy enough. The skulls are probably buried only about three feet down, down by the feet of uh, Abby and Andrew, but uh, no DNA that I'm aware of. No. I do, I have another talk that talks about this, the state of crime scene investigation in 1892 and whether that would have helped here. Like the blood spatter evidence, uh, that kind of stuff. Fingerprinting had just started, but her fingerprints are everywhere. You know, so unless you find fingerprints in blood somewhere, which they didn't, that's not going to do you any good. No murder weapon and no blood fingerprints, so that doesn't help a lot. Good point, though. I mean, I don't know what that would really help you do. Uh, maybe they could find somebody else's DNA, you're, you're thinking? I don't know. All the clothes were burnt up in the stove, so, you know. <laughs> Anybody else? Any questions? Thank you. Eat some cake. <laughs>